I'm sorry I ever hey, bought it. Hey, folks, you aren't seeing this for much longer, okay? Unless you're on Twitch. If you're on Twitch, then you already have been seeing it. Uh, but you, you, YouTube, uh, not going to get this live. Now, if you're watching YouTube later, you will get to continue to see this because we will continue to upload uh, DTNS video to the youtube.com slash daily tech news show. So I guess, I don't know how many people are watching right now. It doesn't tell me anymore in the Hangouts on Air thing. Billions. So both of you watching on YouTube Live, just keep that in mind. Twitch.tv slash good day internet, the place to go. All right. Billions. Are you all ready to do daily tech news show? I yeah. am. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. Here we go. Three, two. Felipe Carvalho has supported independent tech news directly for five years. Be like Felipe. Become a DTNS member right now. Patreon.com slash DTNS. This is the Daily Tech News for June 5th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. From Salt Lake City, where the pro stand will cost me an extra thousand dollars, I'm Scott Johnson, and I'm the show's producer, Roger Chen. Wait, the pro stand, an extra thousand on top of the thousand? Or are you just saying like everyone? <laughs> I'm just saying that stupid stand is a thousand dollars, and I can't matter whether you're in Salt Lake or not. Okay, I got it. Yeah, I got it. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about one of the things that Scott did like from the WWDC announcement, uh, sidecar, not the drink, uh, not the thing you put on your motorcycle, but the way to use your iPad as an external display. Um, but let's start with a few other tech things you should know. Chairman of TSMC, Mark Liu, said Wednesday that restrictions on U.S. companies supplying products to Huawei will have a short-term impact on TSMC, though its 2019 profit outlook remains unchanged. While TSMC said its shipments to Huawei have not been affected, Liu did tell reporters, quote, when there's no Android system in a smartphone, many people have doubts on whether the market will accept it. Skype officially launched screen sharing for Android and iOS. The feature has been in beta for more than a month. Of course, it's been on the desktop forever. The option is now in the menu in the bottom right corner of the screen while you're in a video call on your mobile device. And other beta features like the ability to tap to make the call controls disappear are also coming out of beta into the regular release. It'd be nice if they made a decent desktop version. Hey, Microsoft and Oracle will create a high speed or not recreate, create a high speed link between their data centers in order to make cloud services from the two companies work better together. Companies will also support log into services from either company with a single username and the ability to get tech support from either company. Microsoft has similar deals with SAP and Adobe. The move is seen as a way for Microsoft and Oracle to compete uh, better with AWS. So Microsoft Oracle? Uh, Oracosoft. Oracoft? Oracoft. Yeah. I think Microsoft Oracle. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about something that has been eating away at the heart of the internet uh, the past several days. YouTube announced Wednesday it will, well, this is separate from what I was referring to. YouTube announced Wednesday it will remove videos that deny well-documented violent events, including the Holocaust. It will also remove videos that promote groups that claim superiority to others to justify discrimination. That announcement came after the following. YouTube also announced Wednesday it will remove videos that deny, oh, that's already, I already said that part. Uh, Vox writer and video host Carlos Meza has complained in public and to YouTube that YouTube creator Steven Crowder makes videos with derogatory and mocking remarks about Maza's sexuality and ethnicity every time Maza posts a video on Vox. Maza calls the videos harassment, while Crowder says he's joking, calling them friendly ribbing. YouTube's harassment and cyberbullying policy guidelines state, Content or behavior intended to maliciously harass, threaten, or bully others is not allowed on YouTube. YouTube says it reviewed Crowder's videos, and while it found, quote, language that was clearly hurtful, the videos as posted don't violate our policies, end quote. YouTube also added, quote, opinions can be deeply offensive, but if they don't violate our policies, they'll remain on our site, end of that quote. YouTube also clarified, quote, even if a video remains on our site, it doesn't mean we endorse slash support that viewpoint. All right, that's the end of the YouTube quotes. In response, Maza says YouTube, quote, has decided that targeted racist and homophobic harassment does not violate its policies against hate speech or harassment. However, later in the day on Wednesday, YouTube announced it would demonetize Crowder's channel for violation of the YouTube partner program policies. Now, these are a separate set of policies 
meant for partners, people who get uh, monetization, get ad revenue, special other benefits uh, with YouTube. He is being demonetized because YouTube's partner program policies prohibit channels that upload videos that result in widespread harm to our community of creators, viewers, and advertisers. Now, I'm sure everybody has an opinion on whether YouTube should or should not be doing what in this situation. Uh, if you come into the issue with the opinion that the comments are unallowable, then you're gonna believe YouTube is wrong, that they, they should get rid of the Crowder. If you think the comments are allowable, even if you don't agree with them, then of course you'll think YouTube is right because you'll come down on their side, although you may disagree with the demonetization. That discussion is about speech, not even about free speech, it's about speech on YouTube. And we'll end up just looking at what was said and where your thoughts fall on whether that should be outlawed or not. And you probably have your own answer for that. But outside of this particular incident, uh, a question we've been returning to multiple times in situations like these on multiple platforms is who gets to decide where that line is? You always have your idea and you may say like, oh no, Crowder's definitely over the line. Or you may say, no, I don't like it, but he's inside the line. But YouTube is deciding that line for millions of people because Crowder has millions of subscribers. Should YouTube be judging this? And if not, who should? Uh, is the question that I think we want to entertain. Now, two things before we, we kick this around a little bit. One, I had a, an excellent interview with Yael Eisenstadt uh, from the policy uh, from the uh, Foundation for Humane Technology. I know I'm getting that wrong, but I get it right in the interview that will come out this Saturday. And we talk a lot about platforms and what their responsibilities are. Also, my editor's desk, which is a patron benefit, I want to dig into what I think about this in a little more detail uh, this week. So if you're uh, a patron, look out for that. Uh, but I want to go around the horn here, uh, and Sarah, we'll start with you. When, should you two be judging this, and if not, who should? What are you? What are, what are your impressions on that? I, I don't. None of us have the answer yet. Yeah, it's funny. In theory, I I do side with the the platform is not at fault. It is a tool that people are using to channel information, whether it be information that you agree with or you don't. That's where I stand in theory. YouTube, Facebook, there are several others are sort of too big to go into that category at this point, I feel, uh, it, because there's so much negative information that's being passed around. Now, this is somebody saying, hey, this is super discriminatory, this is unfair, blah, blah, blah. And that uh, I'll, I'll stay out of the details of that for our purposes, but I, I do believe that when you are a platform as big as YouTube and so many millions of views, and so many millions of users and content creators and people making money, and that's an important part of this as well, then yeah, we might be getting to a point where YouTube has to say, I know it's not a free speech thing, but we want to be a nice place. We want new users and we don't want people to abandon us. Um, Scott, what about you? For me, it's, I'm kind of, I feel similar to the way that Sarah does. Um, this isn't the government. It's a platform. They get to decide what they want to have on it. And I don't care kind of how big they get that's still kind of their decision. But I do think they're kind of bad at having clear, very understandable um, policies. If they were more clear and more nuanced and more granular, even though they can never really be perfect, they're never gonna answer everybody's, every, you know, every single little thing somebody may have an issue with. I think that's important that they then adhere to their own policies. And many are arguing, I'm not necessarily, but many are arguing that they're not adhering to their own policies. Um, so I think it's on YouTube to be more clear about that sort of stuff. I, I would say this one bit of difference I have with <laughs> a classification of the comments that were being made about this, uh, Maza creator by the other Crowder dude, he says it's friendly ribbing. And I would say, uh, with friendly ribbing like that, who needs enemy ribbing? It's, <laughs> it's not nice ribbing. Like it's the worst kind of friendly ribbing I can imagine. So it kind of goes to what Tom said about how it's so there's so many sides to take from that dumb comment all the way to the top level. Should should YouTube even get involved? How involved should they be? 
then this opens up into areas of like pornography and a million other things that people have problems with when it comes to public platforms like this. Sure. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, lots of people who would be considered bullies say, eh, friendly ribbing. Well, it, it's in the eye of, the, of yeah. the recipient, isn't it? So. Well, and right. that, that's where, it get, that's where, you know, any discussion about this is going to start to break down because we, and I see people in our chat room already, like hate speech is not friendly ribbing, but someone else is going to look at this and say, well, I don't think that's particularly hate speech. It may be offensive, but just being offensive isn't hate speech. And it all becomes, where do you draw the line and who gets to draw the line? If this was WordPress, would be an entirely different situation because people would say, would have a different feeling about like, well, then I guess you have to go to libel or you might have to go to, you know, uh, some, some other kind of harassment law. You would turn to law enforcement. But because it's YouTube, and even though YouTube wants to present itself as a platform, YouTube is perceived as a channel. It's perceived as a website itself. Mm -hmm. People feel like YouTube should have more responsibility for the content of the people on it. Uh, even if it wasn't, you know, take it beyond WordPress. If this if this guy just created his own website with his own streaming, uh, your recourse would be, well, you, I guess we could try to pressure the host, uh, which has been done before sure. for extreme cases. But is this that extreme? And then I think people would start to draw their lines differently. So it, it really ties into how YouTube has, and they're not the only ones, presented themselves as a an impartial platform, just just like any web host, but really acted like a channel in that they say, well, here's when you can make money and here's things you can link to. Uh, and so when it benefits them, they act like a website. When it, it doesn't benefit them, they try to act like a platform. And yeah. you've seen this with 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 Twitter as well. I can think of scenarios where, you know, there's outrage about a, a, a someone's account that seems to be discriminatory or 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 tweeting hate speech. And Twitter says, well, it doesn't really like doesn't really violate our guidelines, but then that person's verified check mark kind of goes away and people go, well, hold on a second. Like, what do you do? Are you kind of half stepping back? And I think that in this situation, and I'm not totally sure what YouTube should have done differently today, if anything, but there's a little bit of a half backtrack that, that almost upsets people more because it doesn't seem in line with, I mean, you're either on one side of this or the other, like pick a stance. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, you can come up with all kinds of, of variants on impartial platforms and some have more responsibility for their content than others. If the phone company is not responsible for someone calling your house uh, and harassing you. That's the police department. You call them and say, hey, get this guy to stop calling me. Right. The phone company is responsible for robocalls. We, we've decided that we want to push some of that responsibility on the phone company. So each platform is different. Uh, and and this is this is a brand new type of platform, uh, and these platforms have not wanted to take a hand in moderating content. They've wanted to be neutral carriers, common carriers, and they're not. If People they, certainly if, don't perceive them that way. If I was starting a brand new social video platform tomorrow, here is what I would do. I would have standards to start with, and I would aim for high standards. Whatever those are, I'm not going to define them here, but I would aim for them to be higher than normal standards, and then everything would have to adhere to it. And when things would come up that go, oh, that's weird, we hadn't accounted for that, we would have very open, public-facing conversations within the company to decide whether that's now part of those new policies or not. Are we going to take things down that, that's, for that That's or not, not new, though. That, it's that's not new. done from time immemorial. It's, it's just YouTube, Facebook, even Twitter, uh, they they don't want to come down on one of the previous categories and go by those established practices. No, I totally agree. I guess my point is that I would do that from the get go instead of being half robots, half people. When are the robots deciding? When are the people deciding? Like that that to me is YouTube's biggest uh, optics problem, and they're going to have to do something to get around that because that's their biggest problem. They're so freaking big, they can't just ignore this. They can't just simply rely on well, we don't know, and we'll let the people decide. Like they have to take some kind of stand. They have to make a little but more. But if they do that, then they become the website that is the arbiter of the content on their platform. Yeah. And then they become liable. And I get and, they, and, and you may be right that they, that they have to do that. They don't even have to become liable to do that. There's, there's ways to operate within the CDA as a, as a website that allows comments. Yeah. That's not the way YouTube wants you to see them, even though that's the way everybody sees them. Yeah. I think we can all agree that battery life is a good mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am 100% behind longer battery life, as long as it doesn't explode. 
I, <laughs> same. <laughs> There's always a caveat, isn't there? <laughs> iOS 13 is using a new algorithm to determine when your phone is charging overnight in order to extend battery life. Continually charging a phone to 100% all night long, over and over when not in use, actually shortens the life of lithium ion batteries. The new approach keeps the phone charged only to 80% until it's near your wake up time when then it makes sure the battery will be at 100%, which is amazing if you sleep on a regular pattern, which most people do, but but it, it, this is an interesting tactic. Yeah, I hope they do it based on, uh, Thomas mentioned in this this morning on TMS, we talked about this a little bit in his segment, but it'd be really cool if it tied into your to your alarms and it knew that, well, mm -hmm. he's gonna get up at seven and probably hit the snooze bar once, or I don't know how smart it can be, but it would be cool if it could see those things so that the pattern could be more established and it can make those determinations as to when to run to the finish line and make you full 100 before you get up. Uh, Cause otherwise without knowing those details, it doesn't actually hurt this for me. I think this is rad and it's something that I want to see in all sorts of devices that use batteries, not just my phone. Yeah. If people don't understand, there's a, a 40, 80 rule. Uh, which you shouldn't let your lithium ion battery go below 40% charge. You shouldn't let it go above 80% charge as often as possible. Everybody knows it's going to happen sometimes, but if you can keep it most of its life between 40 and 80, it will have a longer life because of that. And this is a, a an operating system level attempt to, to try to help you do that because otherwise when you're asleep at night, it goes to 100 and then back to 92 and then 100 and then, you know, whatever. Uh, it keeps it keeps cycling, which shortens your battery life. So this would keep it below 80, which would extend the battery life. Yeah. Do we know? I mean, what is the average lifetime of a phone battery these days? I don't know if none of us probably know that. You should have looked that up before the show. You know, I should have looked that up before I asked it. I mean, the, li the lifetime is pretty long. The quality of life. <laughs> <laughs> you get diminishing returns. That's, that's for yeah, sure. no, exactly. That's the better question. What's the yeah. quality lifetime? Because yeah, the lithium ion batteries can last for years and years and years, but they only they may only charge for a minute. There you go. Minute. Uh well, Amazon announced a handful of new things at its RE Mars conference, the Remars conference, however you want to say it. Amazon showed off its prime air delivery drone. It's a vertical takeoff and landing hybrid aircraft with thermal cameras, depth cameras, and sonar that Amazon claims make it quote as robust and as stable as a commercial aircraft, unquote. Well, I want to fly in one then. Uh, Amazon says its goal is delivering packages in a 15 mile range up to five pounds in less than 30 minutes, starting in a matter of months. New new listeners to the show don't know that this is my moment to go zip line, Australia. <laughs> people have been doing these deliveries. Amazon is not the leader in this space. Why do they keep getting credit? But I'll give Amazon uh, some credit this time. They actually said a matter of months instead of someday. So it looks like it might actually be getting closer for Amazon to join in on the drone delivery space. Yeah, and this, and they're also talking same day uh, delivery stuff, which is none of that's been brought to like cities in the U.S. Really, not. not oh yeah, really. we have same day delivery. Here. Not same day. I'm sorry, same day by a vertical uh, landing and taking off drone in my. Friend. Oh no, in Australia, their their company's doing the same day. Yeah, you order a burrito and they fly it out to you. Yeah, but not in Salt Lake City, they don't. So No, there you go. Now yeah. you've hit on a truth. So that's my point is you know, <laughs> we don't have this here. So I'm looking forward to the first day <laughs> I, one comes in for a landing on my desk or on my on my desk. That'd be cool too on my desk. <laughs> it just came right on in. <laughs> and, and this drone looks pretty cool. They have a bunch of sensors to make sure it doesn't hit your dog in the backyard and stuff. They they talked about that particularly as, as a use case, which is important, especially for me because I have two dogs. So. At the same time, Amazon is, is very good about helping you order a bunch of stuff at once. And uh, it, Amazon has its new, what's your preferred day delivery? So you can get all your stuff in, you know, it, and, and make it easier for you to accept your packages at home. Something that's five pounds or less isn't much. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the things that I'm ordering on Amazon are more than five pounds. Yeah, you can't, even get a, the box. you can't even get a decent burrito that way. So. <laughs> well, I mean, I prefer my burritos to be more than five pounds, but that, you know, that it kind of comes into like, oh, are we talking more like food delivery? Because it's, it's, it's little small. things. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. exactly. Sundries. Uh, Amazon also announced Style Snap coming soon to Android and iOS. It will let you take a photo or upload an image of an outfit you like. And it'll then use some machine learning to tell what the shirt is and the pants and the skirt and all of that stuff. And then find similar clothing items that are available for sale on Amazon. I tried this out earlier today. Uh, I first started with the shirt that I'm wearing now. Anybody who's not watching the video, it's kind of flowery and mm -hmm. has you know a variety of, of, of nice flowery colors. And 
Amazon was pretty good at offering up things that looked like the shirt, uh, not necessarily a t-shirt, not necessarily exactly the same color, but I was impressed by, huh, that actually looks pretty good. Then I tried it with a picture of me and a couple other people where we're all wearing dresses and they're, they're yeah. all different dresses and Amazon. I couldn't tell Amazon which one to choose. Ah. It decided to just choose the pattern that it decided. Uh -huh. And then it offered up some, some, uh, variety and some options. And those options were again, not off the mark, but I thought, well, yeah, it's going to be kind of weird if it was a, if it was an image with, with too many patterns, too many colors. And then the last one I tried was something with text. It was like black t-shirt with uh, red text. Hmm. Well, the text is really important, right? Cause it's like, that's right. probably like a joke t-shirt what or whatever. Well, yeah. yeah. Thing. Right. And so it offered me lots of black t-shirts with red text that I would never want mm. because it was going off the colors. Not, not, not the actual yet. text. You gotta put the most CR in there, Amazon. Come on. Yeah, exactly. It, 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 kind of, it was, it was kind of fun little experiment though. Can't hurt. I'm going to feed a still of today's show, uh, see if it'll get me Scott's glasses. All right, do it. <laughs> They're cheap, and I look like a beetle. So there you, you go. You do, you do, yeah. and that's always a good thing. Tell us about the last announcement, Scott. <laughs> Finally, Amazon announced improvements to its voice assistant's ability to hold a conversation without having constantly to say its name. Amazon says it's working to predict what a user will want to say next and guide the conversation. I feel weird about that. It's uh, in its demo. The assistant went from a question about what movies were playing nearby to selecting a movie, buying tickets, making a restaurant reservation, watching a trailer, and ordering an Uber. Uh, it will go live to users in the coming months. So it's not doing actions on the predictions. It's trying to guess like, okay, I think he's going to say this next. I'm going to listen for that. So it has more accuracy when you don't have to say the wake word. If it's like, oh, order me an Uber. It's like, ah, that's what I thought he was going to say. Great. I'm on that. I've got the Uber set. So don't get freaked out that it's going to like try to predict and then guess wrong. And then an Uber comes. You're like, I didn't want an Uber. That That's not what they're saying is going to happen. Yeah, it sounds like it's still going to confirm everything you want to do. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's trying to guess what you're going to say next so it can be ready to respond. That's all. Wasn't there a version of the Echo that was doing the style thing? Not to jump to our second announcement, but wasn't there something that you bought? It was a piece of hardware. Yeah. It was There's one that, that has a, a camera. Uh, and then you can, you can put on clothing and it'll, it, yeah, it'll, it'll use the same technology to find similar items and stuff. I wonder if that's going away with this other thing. Anyway, I, no. I, I no, like I where Amazon's going with this. It's, it's not unlike some of the stuff that we heard at Google IO, uh, where Google's assistant is, is smarter without having to constantly say the wake word. What I find as, especially at home, especially cause I'm playing around with all these smart light bulbs. And so I'm trying to make them do stuff and half the time my assistant is getting it wrong. And so I'm like, no, 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 no. All right. And so I have to start over each time. That's what I want. I want sort of a, no, that's not what I meant. We're having a conversation. I meant this. And I want her to be like, oh, okay, I understand what you're saying. And so that, 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 that conversation is, is more what I'm looking for rather than saying, oh, you're going to a movie. Perhaps you'd want an Uber. Perhaps I would, but often I wouldn't. Yeah. But again, she's not going to suggest it. The way this is working is inside it's predicting so that it's better at recognizing, oh, this is still that same conversation versus you just talking to someone else in the room. And they're like, yeah, that doesn't sound like what I would expect them to ask me. So I'm going to ignore that. That right. also gets much closer to asking for multiple things in the same sentence, which right now it doesn't do very well. It does some things like that. Mm -hmm. But if I want to turn off two smart device lights at the same time, I have to wait for it to do one and then come in with a new command and tell it to do the other and not both. I would love to be able to do both. This seems like not exactly that announcement, but this this tech leads that direction, and I'm I'm all for that thing getting smarter. Hey, folks! If you want to get all the tech headlines each day and be smarter yourself, uh, just take five minutes. That's all it takes. Daily DailyTechHeadlines.com. Do it right now. All right, let's talk about your favorite. Is this your favorite thing that was announced at WWDC? I mean, I know weirdly, it was. weirdly, it kind of was. I actually liked a lot of stuff that I saw. Um, the, the Mac Pro is not for me because I can't afford that freaking thing, but I think that's an awesome piece of hardware, and I'm excited about its use in studios and things. Um, there was a lot to like, but of all the things that got talked about, they ended up being iPad-related and kind of small mentions. They weren't major points of interest during the the conversation. So, yeah, it's uh, it's weird that I... I I fixated on on Sidecar so much. A Sidecar lets you use your iPad as a second display for your Mac. Uh, you don't you don't have to plug it into the Mac, right? It just right. you can just pair it uh, with the Mac. And Duet uh, is a system that does this right now, so it's kind of moving into Duet's territory, which Apple does from time to time. Mm -hmm. uh, works with any Mac app that supports stylus input. It can work as a creative tool like a Wacom tablet, which I think probably one of the things you're looking at, right? I am. And I, and I have to mention, um, another 
current product that does this very thing that is probably going, oh man, I can't believe they're they're integrating this is Astropad Studio, which was a great app, still is. You pay monthly for it. It's like seven or eight bucks a month. And you use it as a way to either wirelessly or wired control your second display with your iPad Pro. And it uses Photoshop or a million other apps uh, as like you would a Wacom. So your mention of Wacom Wacom is a good idea uh, because that in, in particular, this is what jumped out at me. This is a, whether Apple means it to be or not, this is a shot over the bow a little bit at artists in general. There has already been a huge uptick in iPad use by illustrators, commercial artists, painters, uh, people working in digital space are using them like crazy apps like uh, Procreate and the upcoming supposed full-blown version of Photoshop that's coming natively to the iPad is a big deal. It's not out yet, but that that was announced, sort of soft announced by by Adobe. Which is probably, by the way, why it wasn't listed among the supported stuff uh, that they showed on stage, because I think Adobe's like, well, we kind of want to have people buy the full blown thing or at least subscribe to our service so they can use it. So I don't know. I'm kind of iffy on that point. But let me get to the to the meat and potatoes here and why this is a big deal. So uptick of that device as a artist tool has has really grown. Honestly, sometimes it feels like without Apple's knowledge or blessing, they don't really know what they had there. The pencil happens to be extremely fast and combine that with good software and you have one of the best and certainly most portable solutions when it comes to art. Certainly latency wise, I've said this on the show before, nothing I've used comes close to it. And that includes high end Wacom and includes the best surface stuff Microsoft's working on. It's really kind of state of the art in that one regard. But one of its limiting factors has always been you got to run iOS tablet software. And there's some good stuff out there. But if you want to do Illustrator, Designer, Photoshop, uh, there's a whole list of these that they set on the stage. ZBrush, Substance Painter, Substance Designer, Sketch, Principal Painter, Motion, Maya, the list goes on. If you want to use all of those industry standard things for artists and creators, you kind of didn't have a whole lot of choice to get a big expensive Wacom tablet. And that's just where you had to live. Now there's this option. It may not be as big as a 24 inch Wacom or larger, but it is a really nice uh, pared down solution that you can also take other places with you. So turning that into the secondary tablet for artists is going to be huge because again, like I've already said, they've already sort of invested in this and now they're finding a way to connect the two and they don't have to have a giant piece of hardware here. And I love Wacom. I don't want this to sound like I'm spelling out the funeral plans for Wacom and their tablets. Yeah, you're not planning to whack Wacom. No, nobody should either. They're they're pretty incredible hardware, but they do need to have an answer for this because this is a really compelling solution. And I, for one, am super stoked about it. I used uh, Astropad Studio and likely won't once this comes out because I won't need to anymore. Um, and that's okay. I, I'm fine with Apple integrating this. Now, we don't know how well it's going to work. Will the latency take a hit? They already said during that conference that the pen was going to be increased or uh, had latency dropped even lower from 20 where it is currently, which is already insanely fast, down to five. They didn't do any details on why that is. I hope it's just software and not new pens. That'll piss everybody off. But uh, who knows? Maybe it comes with a thousand dollar stand. I have no idea. But the point is uh, pencil stand. Yeah. That combined with the fact that now artists and creators are going to be able to use all their favorite stuff with an external uh, display and hopefully at speeds that I don't know, come close to what we use with AirPlay and other technologies that let us wirelessly connect Macs to other things. I could not be more excited about this turn of events. And it was the biggest thing for me at the show. Yeah. Uh, folks, what do, what do you think about Sidecar? Or if you have a favorite thing that was announced this week at Remars or WWDC, let us know. There's lots of ways to participate, right, Sarah? Right. In fact, our subreddit is one of those ways. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Lots of good WWDC stories this week in our subreddit. So keep those and other topics that you care about coming so we know what you want to hear more about. If you hang out on Facebook, join our Facebook group. If you haven't already, facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. Let's check out the mailbag. Got a great one from Suzanne. This is in response to our conversation yesterday about libraries. Suzanne says, thanks for the shout out to libraries as part of the story on the Hamilton Public Library, an open library project. 
Project of Internet Archives on DTNS 545. I'm a consulting librarian with Montana State Library, and part of what we do is provide consortial access to digital materials so it can be affordable even for those in rural areas with underfunded libraries. It can be difficult navigating the 15 cents of copyright as well as the proprietary restrictions of many of the content providers. Too many times I've heard tech pundits the ride restrictions we're subject to is just one copy, one user that are indeed meaningless in the digital world. We see it too, but they're not our choice. So we're constantly looking at additional models such as the open library. And allow me to put in a little plug for one of our other key concerns, privacy. Unlike online search engines and booksellers, librarians don't share records of what you've read, listened to, or watched without a subpoena. And we strive to educate the public about privacy in the digital age. Oh, thank you, Suzanne. What a wonderful, uh, what a wonderful note and great points, uh, especially about privacy. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that. Absolutely. Uh, keep doing, keep, keep fighting the good fight, Suzanne. Uh, libraries for life. Also, thanks to Scott Johnson for being with us. Scott, what's been going on since we saw you last? Oh, lots of fun stuff. You want to see some of the art I create with said iPad Pro and you're thinking, man, I don't know if I believe it. That thing just used to be for basically a bigger, fatter iPhone. Well, I got good news for you. You can do some cool stuff these days and I'm doing my best. So check it out over at frogpants.com. You can find that. You can find all the podcasts I host. I do one with Tom Merritt every week called Current Geek and I cannot say enough about our last episode. Uh, so go check that out over at frogpants.com as well. If you're looking to chat with me, I'm usually available and around on Twitter at Scott Johnson. Thank you, everyone who supports us on Patreon, patreon.com slash DTNS. Once again, uh, my editor's desk uh, essays, their audio essays come to you at the $5 level and above. Uh, but there's also all kinds of other member benefits at all the different levels. Uh, and you get ad-free versions of the RSS feed. You get access to the Discord where you can actually listen to Good Day Internet uh, live in audio in case twitch.tv slash Good Day Internet doesn't really work for you. Uh, sign up right now, patreon.com slash DTNS. And S. Do you have feedback for us? Well, we have an email address, and that is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Bookmark it. Write us early and often. We're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more and tell a friend at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with the triumphant return of Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> well, I enjoyed it, that's for sure. Mm-hmm.